Work shouldn't feel like a drag, and you shouldn't have to sacrifice your soul for a job you love. Determined to rethink the future of work, she's out of her depth on purpose. With fresh ideas, interviews, and stories from her life on the road, meet Europe's newest digital nomad, Blair Palmer. Hello and welcome to episode 84 of A Brilliant Gamble. I hope you are really well. I am in Italy. We've moved into our Italy house, which will be our home for the next month or so. It is very hot. Now, I know that it's been very hot in a lot of places, but it's particularly hot here in Italy. We've had temperatures around 36, 37, something like that most days. A little bit of rain, which has been lovely, but mainly hot. So we have been adapting our routine to, you know, adapt to the weather, um, doing much less in the afternoon, not planning anything really for the afternoons, focusing on doing work and homeschool and that kind of thing in the morning, taking the afternoons to relax, and then kind of mid to late afternoon, we'll start doing some other stuff again. That's pretty much been our routine, which is really interesting because I've never particularly had to adapt my routine to the weather I've adapted my routine based on appointments in the diary and how I'm feeling inside myself, what my intuition is telling me, um, what my daughter needs, all those kind of things. But pretty much for the first time, we're having to take the weather into account, which is very interesting when you're seeking balance. Anyway, on to today's show. This week, I'm interviewing someone I know really well. Elizabeth Dunn is co-founder of Two Desks, a creative support agency that's been helping me since I started thinking about A Brilliant Gamble. There are lots of reasons to talk to her, as you'll see, but my main motivation was the need for support. Balance is impossible if you try to do everything yourself. It can only be achieved if, as she says in this interview, you're willing to let someone help you. Now, I'm a big fan of outsourcing and I've had a team since pretty much the very, very earliest days of my business. But I know that making that commitment to bring other people in as freelancers or to outsource some of your work or even some of the chores around the house can be a really, really big decision. So I thought it'd be great to talk to Elizabeth and find out from her how letting someone help you can actually help you to create more balance. In our discussion, we talk about what she does and how she helps people like me, her own brilliant gamble or gambles, and the belly of the whale hitting the wall, as I did rather spectacularly last week. And who was there to help me? Elizabeth was. Elizabeth is honest, charming, funny, and flamboyant, and I'm sure there's loads here for you to be inspired by if you're determined to create a more integrated and balanced life that works for you and those you care about. So let's go over to the interview. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm very well, Blair Palmer. How are you? It's lovely to see you today. Not that anybody else can see you, but believe me, you look lovely. <laughs> Thank you. I've caught a little bit of sun. I'm quite pleased with it. Excellent. Well, I'm happy to report it's very hot in England and it's a little weird. So, Well, listen, there were so many reasons I wanted to talk to you. Um, but one of the main reasons, one of the reasons that we had the idea of having you on the show is that I've talked in the past about my support team and the fact that I couldn't do this trip or I couldn't run my business, in fact, without a number of people kind of doing jobs that I don't have time to do and that I don't have, that I don't like to do and that I'm not good at. Um, and you're one of them. You're one of the people in that team. So I thought it'd be really useful to have you on the show and talk about what you do for people and, and why we need that and then get into some of the more personal stuff around your own because you've taken brilliant gambles of your own, of course. I have. Well. I, I definitely have. And it's... Uh... It's weird. Most days I, I feel quite immature on the inside. But when I look back, I realize that actually I, I have done some pretty amazing things, which is kind of cool. It is. It's really cool. So let's start with um, what you do for people. So my initially we were introduced because I needed a new website. But you're and that's the kind of thing, you, you know, I could have built my website myself. People do. Um, it's not that hard these days, but it was one of those things that I thought, actually, I need 
I need some input and I need someone to be doing that while I'm doing something else. But that's, that's not all you do, is it? No, no. We actually provide what we like to term a, a creative support. So it, the company kind of came about all from an EA background. So from a pure assisting background, scheduling calls, booking tables, that kind of right hand left brain support um, that you get with a very, very close knit client uh, EA type relationship. But we also had skills that we've honed over the years. So actually we do a little bit of the EA stuff for some heritage clients still because I enjoy it and I love my clients. But a lot of what we do is actually website development and design, graphic design, social media support. Uh, we do a lot of the things that people wish they had the time to do, but just don't really know how to get started. They know it's good for their business and they know they need to do it but it's a budget issue. It's a, I want to be on Twitter, but I don't know how. So we really help a lot of people with social media branding. Uh, it's great to have an outside perspective, look at your brand and go, I see where you're trying to go, but here's this. So we, we like to term it creative support because it's more than, it's more than just any one thing. It's kind of a, a suite, if you will, of, of kind of support for small, small to medium businesses that want to get a get their stuff together and, and be more organized and work better as a team because we have a lot of experience with remote working and uh, people who finally kind of realize that they can't do it all. So that's kind of our client base and we have a lot of really good fun and, uh, and a lot of laughs along the way. So it's, uh, yeah, creative support. When I first started in my business, of course, I tried to do everything myself. I didn't have any budget and um, I invented a company name and I invented my own logo. In fact, I think I got my sister to design it for me and it was actually very lovely. Um, but I didn't get any kind of formal professional input until I realized that I was coming across a little bit unprofessional. And I, I, I wonder at what point do people think to themselves, there's the, I've got a limited budget. Most of us have a, have a limited budget. Even big, big companies have limited budgets uh, to some extent, but, but I've got to spend my money wisely. How do they make the decision that that is, it's time to bring in some outside support? I think for a lot of people, it's their helpful friends who kind of really level with them and say, I like what you're trying to do, but you're not quite there. It's also people who see um, sometimes the work we do for other clients. We have a pretty close knit client group. So sometimes people will see stuff, but I think people really come to us when they've tried to do it or they want to do it so badly. Uh, and they just have the realization that either they are mostly time limited. They don't have the time to learn web design. They don't have the time to get an education in the marketing psychology of color and all the stuff that we do. And I think, I think it's people who've done a little bit of soul searching who come to us and, and, and people who kind of go, right, my charge out rate is X to do what only I can do. But there are people on the planet whose charge out rate is Y and they can do that for me. So let's, let's take, an invisible client Blair and let's say that this person is a salesperson and they win really big contracts why would they be doing a something that's not their talent or passion trying to do something that isn't their thing and they're wasting this this time at their call out rate so actually I think a lot of people come to us when they realize that their time is better spent doing what only they can do and, and that's usually the big ticket stuff. And why not uh, outsource uh, what is somebody else's passion? You know you're gonna get good work from them. Hopefully you've got a really, uh, you've looked around and you get a really nice person that you feel, well, they don't have to be a nice person, but somebody that you feel you have a really good connection with and let that person do it. So it's, a, it's mainly a, a people who have decided that actually their time is more valuable. And I know that sounds like I might be putting myself down, but I'm not at all. I don't do what you do. You don't do what I do kind of thing. So it's mostly people who've decided that their time is really better spent doing their passion, not mine. I think that's so important because, you know, you might think to yourself, well, I could spend 20 minutes booking a train. You know, it, 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 it's only 20 minutes and 
what sort of person rings someone else up and says, can you book my train for me? You know, in, in the rest of our lives, these are things we do for ourselves. But my, my experience, I, I told you this story another time, but um, the, the one time that I thought to myself, oh, I'm just going to book it. I'm not going to bother asking my PA to book it. I ended up booking a return journey on, in the wrong month. Oh. So I ended up, yeah, so I ended up getting to the station to come home, realizing that my ticket was for the wrong month, having to buy a last minute ticket to get back for a hundred quid or something and thinking, you know, this is why I should never be allowed to book my own tickets. And the thing is, even if you're not bad at booking tickets, even if you don't, <laughs> even if you don't make those kind of rookie mistakes, it's still 20 minutes that you could have been, that I could have been spending winning some new business or meditating or something that really enhances my practice as a coach um, versus spending 20 minutes doing something that you are an expert at doing. Well, I often talk to clients about, think about, let's use your example of the train booking 20 minutes. What if you at peak performance doing what you do, what can you achieve in that 20 minutes? You could sell 10 grand's worth of business. You could book in a, a really important hair thing that's going to give you the gravitas and look awesome for something new. You could do something for you and let me get on with the stuff you don't want to do that I love doing. It's it's totally win win. I get that, and of course, I'm a, I'm a big advocate. I mean, I've always a bit of, been a big outsourcer right from the beginning. I had a cleaning lady. <laughs> you know, I just it, my my time is so limited. Even when I was a single woman without any kids, I felt like I, there were a lot of things I wanted to do, and cleaning the house was not one of them. And so, for a a bit of you know a bit of cash the problem is solved right it's done so i've always been a big fan of that but but i know that a lot of people feel quite guilty uh, about the outsourcing and that they should do it themselves and that and also they worry about the money you know they think that they and th this does worry me too of course uh, you know that that you you add fixed cost to your life or to your business um, and what you get in return is maybe some time but can you afford that transaction i uh i can certainly understand that i mean come on we all have budgets and we all worry about money but i think what is useful for clients is i always advise people to not come to me because so their friend has an assistant or it would be really nice to not have to book your own Tesco order or for somebody to find your trains. That's nice, but it's a little bit vain. But when people actually make the decision that they are going to make something happen in their business and they are mentally ready to move forward, that's when to outsource your help. So don't, don't do it too early because you won't have anything really for that person to do that they can really get into and add value very deeply to your business bottom line. But when you're ready and you know that I am about to do a month of, I am gonna work on my business, that's when you should bring in support, take the time to find the right person for you. Sometimes you hit it off right away, you've got what, you know, just gobs of trust from the start, Sometimes it takes a while to find your rhythm with somebody and, and talk to that person. And, be, and you know what actually is the annoying part is that to build a really solid right hand, left brain um, relationship, what it takes is time. And what you're trying to save somebody is time. So it's like, if you'll invest in me, I will save you time. And it is so true. But there is that initial investment in going back to the train metaphor. Are you a standard traveler? Do you like a window? Do you always have to have the quiet carriage? So learning stuff like that does take some of the time we're trying to save, but it is so valuable in the long run. And I think kind of thinking about your you won't know until you go ethos, until you have an assistant who actually genuinely adds value to your personal and working life, you sort of don't know what you're missing. I've heard this so many times, you know, for, from, uh, from managers who are taking on all the responsibilities themselves because to brief somebody else to do it 
is going to take longer than just doing it themselves. But of course, of course, yes, there is that upfront investment, but then, then it's gone. Then it's on someone else's shoulders. Um, and, and is this something that you're really familiar with as well? It is actually because people, the kiss of death for people in my, in that part of my occupation is a client who gets frustrated and says, I'll just do it myself. It's faster. If a client says that to me, I know the relationship is going south quickly and I need to turn it around. But when it's, it's that control, it's the, I need to book my train tickets because I know what's best for me. Even though I know I'm really bad at booking train tickets, I'm worried and I'm, I just have to control everything. It's that. And if you can find somebody that you trust, it's a lot easier to let that go. But you kind of have to put your life in somebody else's hands, which is why it's important to find very much the right person. Um, but yeah, it's, it's being able to let somebody help you. And that's, you know what, that delegation, I know it's such a cop out and it's such a, you know, Instagram worthy quote statement, but delegation is an art and a gift and learning how to delegate and delegate well, it is not something that somebody, it, it is something you have to learn and work at. It's not, so you can't just go, oh, I've got an assistant now, go. It takes time. You have to teach them. You have to let them know your preferences. And in the future, it'll pay off in spades. And I guess that's why I say that you have to, you have to outsource this at the right time. Not a vanity time. Not a everybody else is doing it time. It has to be a time when you're ready to put in the work that will eventually pay off. And when I say eventually, I don't mean like, you know, in months, years. I mean, a couple weeks, a couple days if you're, if you're handy and, and, you know, you want to write some notes and stuff. So it, but you have to put in the, just like anything, you have to put in work and putting in work into a relationship with an assistant or some kind of support person, it will pay off beyond belief. You won't know until you go to your assistant and hopefully they delight you and actually show you way more possible than you actually even thought of. This idea of um, letting someone help you, I think that's, it's really critical. You know, we talk about trying to find more balance and trying to get, you know, this right blend of the work that you love and the life that you love and the relationships and time on your own and whatever else it is that, that you want to have into that blend. It simply is not possible if you insist on doing it all yourself, which then means you just have to let people help you and they're going to help you in a way that isn't exactly the way that you would do it because they're not you but but it's, but if you don't let them help you it's impossible you cannot achieve balance it, it, it can't be done it's true and i also think you might be really surprised if you can be open-minded you might be very pleasantly surprised that not only can they help you but they can help you find and discover and learn things that you didn't kind of like you don't know what you don't know. So you might book flights a certain way and you might be missing three quarters of all the flights available on the planet. You might look at weird travel from somewhere and go, well, nope, you just can't travel from there. Whereas somebody like me or you know, the, the, your assistant, they've got all the tips and tricks. This is what they do for a living. This isn't just a pass through job till I get a career. This is what we do and this is what we are really good at. So why not let somebody who's really good at something, just like you're really good at what you do, why not let somebody who loves to book travel do that for you? Because you'll have their energy and passion that you might not have towards that. I can't tell you, three quarters of my job is lending my energy to my clients, letting them know, oh, I got your travel, I got that, giving them comfort that things are being looked after and lending them my energy because I'm excited about something because it's what I love to do. They might not care that paragraph 47 on their website is brilliant, but I'm excited about it. So it's finding that person that you click with, that you're ready to put in some work with. And it, it, I guess what I'm, what I'm kind of boiling back down to is you are making a team. 
And obviously, if you're a digital nomad or if you're a person who travels a lot for work or your business, it's really nice to have a pair of legs on the ground and somebody who isn't moving constantly, who has the time to focus on all the stuff that you don't. So one of the reasons that I think we get on so well and that you are able to understand <laughs> what I'm trying to do with this weird year that I'm having and, and whatever is going to happen next, because obviously the year is going to come to an end, but the gambles aren't going to come to an end. And I hope that you're going to help me with the, with the next one as well. On but my one of the side reasons, all the way, Blair Palmer. <laughs> That feels so good. That's really reassuring. One of, one of the reasons that I think you get it is that you're someone who's taken some gambles of your own. Um, and, and one of the biggest ones was relatively recently where you changed your business. You basically um, got rid of a business that you had created that was really successful and, and created something new based on what you'd learned. So, I mean, just tell, just tell us a little bit about what you were doing before and why you needed to change it. Absolutely. So I, I, I guess all of my background, why I'm good at what I'm good at is I come from a very corporate background in investment banking, a very fast paced background. I was made redundant a long time ago. So I started a company, one of the first virtual assistant teams in the UK. And we did really well. We got up to about eight people and uh, basically doing right hand left brain support for clients all over the UK. And I uh, work with my partner and he is the business manager. And together we just, even though the business was quite successful, we just realized that we, I, actually it kind of ties back. We had strengths and weaknesses as well. And I, we did a lot of soul searching and decided that actually we should drink our own Kool-Aid and, and walk our talk. And why were we ourselves doing things that we didn't enjoy or what we weren't particularly good at? In my case, people management. I'm great at managing myself and Lord knows I can boss clients around and tell them when to get that train we've booked, right? But I'm not, I had to come to terms with the fact that on a one-to-one, -one, I am leading you through your career progression. I am not strong there. And I don't really care when people have dentist appointments or I, I struggled and not that I didn't care about the person, but I had work to do as well. And, and, and I didn't have to find replacements and that it, not my strength. And in this day and age fail fast. Right? So my partner and I, Pedro, we decided that we wanted to do the same kind of thing with a little bit of a pivot more towards the creative because that's where our skill sets lie. And, but we didn't really want to have a team or, or do things that we're not good at. And in my case, managing people. Uh, so we gave this wonderful business to the current and now current employees and basically said, Hey guys, it's been wonderful and we love you all very much, but it's time for us to do something different. And we created a new company that is just us. And it's called two desks because there will never be three or four or eight or whatever. Um, we've actually made the really strange move to limit our business. And you know, it, it, most people want to grow theirs, but we've made a conscious decision to limit ours. Either we are very brilliant or really dumb. Well, I think that the predominant goal, I guess, or measure of success of a business is growth. So the idea is that you might start as a sole trader and we call that a kind of, we call that a lifestyle business. And I remember when I started my business and people would say, oh, it's a lifestyle business, is it? And I'd be really offended hmm. because it sounded like a hobby. It sounded like, oh, well, I just do it on the side to make a bit of pin money because my rich husband is the one that supports the family, which of course was not the case because there was no rich husband. So I felt really offended when people said it's a lifestyle business. But the, the idea is that you're meant to start like that and then you're meant to grow. And you're meant to start employing people and you're meant to start getting office space and you're meant to then rise up and become the, the, the managing partner or the chief executive or whatever it is and let go of the technical delivery of the thing because other people are doing it. 
Mm -hmm. And of course, for some people, that is exactly where their strengths lie. They are brilliant at growing businesses. That's what they're good at. And they don't mind letting go of the, the technical side of delivery. But, but what I really like about what you're saying, and I've done the exact same thing because I had a big team as well in office space and admin, full-time admin people and in the office and I would go to the office every day and see everybody. Um, I let go of that too because there's, it seemed like that was mainly driven by ego. That wasn't necessarily serving the clients mm -hmm. and, um, and it certainly wasn't really serving me because the pressure then just became win the business to pay all these people's salaries. Mm -hmm. I, I that, can't agree with you more. I felt like I was working. I don't mind working all the hours in, on the earth. Everybody is selfish. So I don't feel bad saying this. I don't mind working my butt off for my own personal gain, right? Everybody's selfish. That's our nature. We all are designed to want to succeed and want money and you need money to do that kind of thing. But actually we did a lot of soul searching and decided actually that we really admire and like the people that we work with and we want them to succeed. We treat their businesses as our own and there is a limit to actually how much we can do for people and do it really well. And if we're constantly trying to grow, well, the plates aren't the plates aren't going to get bigger between our two plates aren't going to get bigger or are our two desks whatever but i want to be able to to work for people and do it really well and really thoughtfully and genuinely add value and be of service to them money's great but as long as my lights are on and i can buy some new shoes every now and again and my kids are fed and my dogs are happy i think i've really that's probably my leap is i don't need to be a billionaire i want to be comfortable sure but I would rather have a more satisfying work life by actually working well for somebody than trying to stack up my plate to make a buck. Yeah, I, I think more and more people are reviewing this idea about what a successful business looks like. And maybe it's time that we reclaim this term of lifestyle business because what is so horrific about having a business that provides you with a lifestyle that you love? Well, absolutely why, absolutely why not. it's uh it's actually quite jealousy inducing actually so okay smug instagram people you can poo poo me or judge me because i'm never going to be a billionaire from my business but i guarantee you that i'm really happy to come into work and there are some days when you're on your commute and i'm sitting here in my slippers working my butt off for people and loving every second of it let's talk about whose life is happier and, and you know what? Personal happiness and personal fulfillment is so important. And I think that's also, if you'd asked 25-year-old going into corporate investment banking me, I would have laughed at you. Of course, we all want to make money. <laughs> Don't be dumb. But now 46-year-old midlife ennial me, personal fulfillment and making people happy and, and ending the day knowing that I done good and that I helped somebody way more important to me at this stage in my life. Now, when I retire and I have no pension, talk to me, right? But for right now, my heart is more important than my bank account. My heart and my head are way more important than my bank account. And my bank account, by the way, not doing so bad. Because honestly, if you love the work you do, people want you to work with them. I love that. And I hope that that... Um help some people to think a bit differently about what they might want their business to look like. I remember I coached someone really right near the beginning of when I was coaching business people and um, a wonderful guy. For him, it was all about being the best boss in the world. And so he got these fabulous offices and he got all these people and he wanted to do things like um, give them all gym memberships and um, have them give them access to a, um, a personal PA, you know, a, a sort of a, a lifestyle PA and all of that. And it, I remember being very excited about it and not realizing because I was very new to this and neither of us realized this is not what the business is about. It, it isn't about being the boss of people and everyone thinking you're the best boss. It is really about how do we serve our customers the best way we possibly can. And sometimes the best way you can do that is you shed all the all, all of that stuff, you shed the office space, you shed all the staff and, and you shed the gym membership thrown in and, and you focus on your relationship with your clients. 
I don't know if that is the peak of, of professional maturity or emotional intelligence just grows as we gain life experience and business experience, but being able to recognize that you have certain needs. And for me, it's being appreciated, loved and wanted. I know that we all know that I'm very self-aware and I know my needs and I know my failings and probably they're exactly the same thing, but um, that's what's important right now. And, and you know what, if you genuinely care about your clients, no matter what your business is, right? This isn't, we're not just talking assisting and creative support. We could be talking global organizations selling soft drinks to whoever. If you genuinely care about the work you're doing, you will do it so well, you won't have to worry about business. People will come knock, let's hope, right? But if you genuinely do something you are passionate about that you love doing, what's the saying? Do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, that's really sweet and it looks great on Instagram, but it is totally, totally true. And, and really thinking about it, that's sweet. It's nice. It looks good and, and, and great. You know, I have a thing about, uh, well, you don't know. I have a thing about smug people on Instagram. I laugh at them, right? And I am deathly f afraid that I am going to become a smug person on Instagram. And sometimes I want to be and sometimes I don't want to be. But all the motivational quotes and the, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a she boss, I'm a girl, I'm awesome. It's all fluff. Just do something you love and do it well. And you know what? You will be fine and you will succeed. Be, it might not be the success that you envisioned when you were 20 or 30, but you will succeed and you will be happy. Or just stay as you are and keep driving yourself into the ground and, and see how that feels in 10 years. So uh, it's, it's so interesting to me that, you know, we, the big gamble that, that you feel that you took was shutting down your other business or handing your other business off and, and creating two desks. But of course, you also took the brilliant gamble of leaving the United States and coming to England to live. But that, for some reason, that doesn't feel to you like a brilliant gamble, because I know that for a lot of people, leaving a country and going and living somewhere else permanently is the biggest the biggest gamble they could take the, the most exciting the greatest adventure but the biggest gamble but it doesn't feel like that to you does it it doesn't it feels like i don't know if it's because it was 18 years ago oh my gosh 18 years ago today i moved to england august the 5th how funny anyway yay me 18 years oh my god i'm old anyway i don't know if it was because it was so long ago and like pregnancy, I've just forgotten all the pain and would do it again in a heartbeat or recommend somebody do it. But for me, it's just something I did. I wanted to, it, you know, I was on a tube train on holiday in 2000 in London. This is so dumb. And I looked around as a tourist, an American loudmouth tourist, because I was even louder than I am now. I know, hard to believe. And I looked at all the cute commuters on the train on the tube and I went oh they look so cute oh and they get to travel like this every day to work and isn't I want to do that and then I had a, a I literally got back from that holiday and went wait a minute I'm an adult if I want to move to England I'll just move to England and I made it happen I found a job I moved. I disappointed my family by, you know, we had those horrible conversations. Hey, by the way, moving to England. See ya. Come back for Christmas. Never really thought I'd stay here for life like I am. But um, yeah, it doesn't feel like a brilliant gamble for me. It's just something I did because I wanted to make it happen. So I did. And I realized that I'm a grown up. I can do this if I want. How do I do it? So it was more of an, ad yeah, it wasn't a thing for me. And it's funny because you saying, oh, you took a brilliant gamble. Sorry, I'll do it in my Blair Palmer verse. You took a brilliant gamble moving, uh, moving to the UK. Well, I did, but maybe I wasn't as self-aware at the time. It just felt like something I needed to do to be happy. So I just did it. Well, what I like about that is that there are things that to an outsider looking in on your life, seem like they're a big deal and to you they aren't hmm. and then there are other things that to the outsider looking in on your life seem like they were nothing but they actually were a really big deal 
Mm. And, and I think, you know, we do that quite a lot. I mean, people will say to me all certain things that I've done are very brave. And I'll think, no, I don't really. It didn't feel, it didn't feel, that didn't feel brave. But this other thing that you think is quite normal and every day, actually that feels, that feels brave to me. So it, in a way, what it says to me is let, you know, we should be our own judge of what's big and what's brave and not, not take anyone else's word for it really. I, oh, I mean, everybody has an opinion. I mean, I touched on it earlier that I work with my partner. He's the other desk in two desks. And when we went to kind of make the very considered leap, I mean, girl, we had offsides. We spoke to coaches. I mean, it was not something that we, we just woke up one morning and thought, hey, let's take our entire, hey, you know how both of our salaries come from the same source? Let's really risk it. It was not like that. We, we, we considered all of it very, very seriously. Because when all of your eggs are in one basket on purpose, you have to really be mindful of the basket, right? So, but when we were deciding way back six years ago to work together, people couldn't be honest with us and say, that sounds like a really bad idea. So instead what they would say is, Oh, I couldn't work with my partner. You're brave. And I thought, well, I'm not brave. I'm doing what's right for me. But hey, cool, you think I'm brave. But why don't you come out and really say what you're saying, which is, oh, that sounds dumb. <laughs> Instead of this passive aggressive, I couldn't do that. Just be honest. Just go, this way. everybody has an opinion. But if you're driven towards something and you know it's the right move for you, grow up, be adult, put on your big girl pants and get stuff done. And you know what? Maybe that's why moving to England doesn't sound like such a big deal to me because I knew I wanted to do it. I knew I was doing it on my own. And you know what? The only person I had to worry about was me. Put on my big girl pants and I made it happen. Where And anybody can do that. So everybody has an opinion and I guess it's up to you or us or me to decide where I place the value on, on all the millions of opinions that are out there. What do I identify with? And more importantly, what do I care about? And honestly, the only opinion I care about is my own opinion of myself, my partner's opinion, my family's opinion, my, you know, the people who I'm close with my client's opinion. I go back to how close I am with my clients, but everybody else can ram it Blair. If it's right for you, it's right for you. So now we've been talking about balance and how you help me with mine. I couldn't do everything be impossible um, without you. So I wouldn't have any balance at all. What about your balance? Because one of the challenges when you love what you do as much as you love what you do is that you end up without the right balance for you. So what, what is, what is balance for you? And do you feel like you're there? I do not feel like I am there. I think the one saving great, I have, uh, so to answer your question, my work-life balance is pretty poor. Um, it is the one area of this divine, perfect thing I'm doing and the thing I love. It's the one area that I actively go, yeah, you know what? I could be better at that. And it's, it's, I'm a firm believer in coaching. It's something that I even think, you know what? I need outside perspective on this because I feel like that's kind of, I love what I do so much that I don't mind working a lot. I don't mind being on call for clients who are traveling to Hong Kong and might get a missed flight and I need to be awake at 3 a.m. I don't mind it because I genuinely care about them as people and, and, and to a lesser extent the work, you know, I don't really care if British Airways is on time in the middle of the night, but so to a lesser extent in this scenario to the work I do, but the people are super important to me. So, at the moment, it's bad balance. It's fat kid on one end of a seesaw kind of balance, right? It's whack. But I don't mind because at the moment, it suits my lifestyle. I'm, you know, I can, I can tune in when I want to tune in. My clients and I have a wonderful understanding that if I'm not available at 3 a.m. when you're in Hong Kong, I'm not. And I will be with the next time I'm, you know, and, and we respect each other and we respect each other's time. I think that goes back to working with people you genuinely care about. But it is something I need to work on, but it's also something I don't necessarily mind 
Like, I know it needs to get better because I think eventually I'll end up burned out and crispy and of no use to anybody. But right now, it's not so bad. So it's, it's one of those things that actually, Blair, I probably need to put my big girl pants on about. It makes a difference, doesn't it? When, when, the, when the lack of balance, it, it depends what it's driven by. So if the lack of balance is driven by fear, fear of uh, you know, not wanting to turn business down or fear of not having enough business, then it feels very different to when the lack of balance is driven by a desire to serve. I, 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 still, you know, I still think that, as you said, you will, it's not really sustainable for the long term but it, kind of what we were talking about before you know everyone has their own idea about what balance looks like mm. and what sacrifices or compromises they're willing to make and what sacrifices or compromises they're not willing to make mm. so you know someone might work a 10 or 12 hour day and that to them feels like it's good balance because that's fine that works really well for their lives someone else you know my ideal is to work about four hours a day on my business and uh, there are other things i do that kind of could count as work but to work on my business work with my clients four hours a day on average and that was that's what balance would feel like to me so we mustn't necessarily judge what balance is by some kind of external if it's more than eight hours a day it's not balanced there is no scale for work-life balance it's not like if you're working nine to five, five days a week, you are perfect. And all the other hours of the week, isn't that wonderful? He's achieved balance nirvana. There's no such thing as work-life balance nirvana. There's really no such thing as work-life balance. If you think about it, unless it's constant, when do you ever, when do you ever turn around and go, you know what? Look at my work. Look at my life. Aren't I balanced? Nobody ever does that. You always want something different because it's Tuesday in January and, and life is different than it was July and on, you know, it's it, balance is constantly changing. So actually trying to achieve this mythical narwhal of an idea of work-life balance. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think we should all strive for work-life balance, but should we really even be calling it work-life balance? Shouldn't we just be calling it hey, a combination of work and life that feels good to me. That's what we should call it. Because honestly, balance is so different to, to people. And what, uh, what works for me and what drives me, if I only spent four hours a day working on stuff for my business, that doesn't suit me. But I love that it suits you. And, and maybe on a, a level, I'm, I'm envious that it suits you. But right now, that's not right for me. And why in the world would I judge you for doing what's right for you? So take work life, yeah, work life balance is great. And I'll let you know if that moment ever happens where, you know, all of a sudden I'll call you up and I'll say, Blair, I've done it. I am balanced. But I wouldn't be sitting by your phone, Blair Palmer. No, I think that's right. I think you put your finger right on it. That there isn't, it's not like you're going to hit on or anyone is going to hit on the right recipe and that's going to work for them every single day because life is happening. So you know, you might have a day where you think, oh, today worked really well. But if you repeated that exact same combination of ingredients the next day, that wouldn't necessarily work. That day. Yeah, no, I think work-life balance is super important. I'm very aware of it because I'm aware of how mine must come. Of course, I'm aware of how must it come across to other people. How does it come across to clients? Well, clients like it because they can get a hold of me all the time. So, so that's fine. But yeah, I think, you know, just, I think it all boils down to do what you love, be happy, do what's right for you. If that's limiting your business, if that's working with your partner, if that's moving to England, if that's having pretty fat kid on a seesaw work-life balance and it works for you and you're genuinely happy, maybe that's balance. Maybe, maybe that is it. And, and the outsiders can look at it and they can either like it or lump it, right? So oh, I think it's, it's one for, it's personal, very personal. Let's um, talk about something slightly different because we've talked about balance. We talked a bit about gambles. We, we, um, okay. I need to be very, very honest with the listener now. Um, I had a moment a few days ago where I basically hit a wall 
we arrived in, and anyone who's been following Instagram knows that I've been slightly spiraling down for a few weeks. Um, and I think I probably hit my rock bottom for now. I mean, who knows, right? In six months time, how I'll be feeling. Maybe I'll hit another one, but I, I probably hit my rock bottom for now. Um, a combination of a lot of weeks of moving around very quickly, um, very, very, very long drive to here in, in Italy, um, and uh, it being very hot, which of course doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't help you to think clearly. And then we had a few problems when we got to our Airbnb. And, uh, oh, and some work stuff. So it was like the, the perfect storm of stressful situations. And I'm away from my home. I'm away from my family. I'm away from pretty much everything that's familiar. And for the first three or four months, that was just delightful. And then it got to the point a few days ago where it just became irritating mm. that, that I had nothing to lean back on, nothing to fall back on. And you and I had a conversation where you were very, very helpful to me and, and helped me to pull me out of my funk. Uh, and I felt brilliant ever since. Um, but what was really interesting about it when we talked about it after was the timing of that. So we are now, I think it's about four and a half months in. I know from my past experiences of making big changes that once you're six months in, things really settle down. But that there is a point between month one and month six where you're going to be in the belly of the whale and that's where I was last week. So tell me, you've got a name for this because you've seen it yourself in the work you've done with virtual assistants at around three and a half months where they hit the wall. You, you call it remote worker syndrome? I do. Uh, it is like, yeah, so actually I did, um, you know, before Two Desks, I worked with a remote team, a fully distributed team for five years, and we would bring on people. We'd advertise this wonderful job of being able to work from home. It's hard work, but at least you get to do it on your terms. And everybody was so gung-ho to start. And awesome, started really awesome. But we found over five years of working as a distributed team, there is a point at three and a half months in where you hit a wall and you realize that what you have isn't as awesome as you thought it was going to be. You, yeah, you get to work from home, but it's a little bit lonely if you're busy and heads down and you don't have time for social interaction, or you might not know where to go for social interaction. You might not have um, other people. You might not have a team around you. We were lucky in that we were a team. And so we could kind of, we had a water cooler um, chat conversation always going during each work day to stay in touch and somebody to say, my kids are doing this, just, just some kind of personal connection. But despite all of that, about three and a half months in, you'll hit a wall and, and we dubbed it remote worker syndrome. And that is where it's, it's interesting to think of it as a belly of the whale type moment, but that's exactly where it is. Things are not as advertised, even if it's just your own advertising in your head to what you think this is going to be all of a sudden you realize that working from home is wonderful, but the kids are coming in from school and you can't do a conference call at four o'clock. Or you realize that it's great working from home, but this is topical. It is hot right now. And nobody wants to be stuck at a desk when you could be out. And it's too tempting to have a garden where you could go sit and sweat and, and be happy. And it's about finding, identifying that that's what's happening and that you're gonna be okay in about a week. <laughs> so if you, can, if you don't know that all of a sudden remote worker syndrome starts to take place at about three and a half, four months, you could give up. It's enough of a mental stress to make you just wanna go, you know what, this isn't for me. I, what was I thinking? This is not what I signed up for. But if you'll push through slightly, just like any belly of the whale moment, you actually will come out and you'll go, okay, I know what that was. So we always made it a point. And by naming it remote worker syndrome, we, we, we wanted to acknowledge to our new hires and I'll acknowledge it to anybody who starts working remotely. I do a lot of advising on remote uh, working for teams and working um, as a distributed team. And I always tell them about it because forewarned is forearmed. And if you know it's coming and a lot of people go, oh, yeah, yeah. it's not me. I'll be fine, man. Look at me. I'm in a bikini in my garden. This is awesome. It happens to everybody. 
And if you're aware of it and you know it's coming, you can grit your teeth and go, ah, that's what they were talking about. Yeah, I feel pretty crappy right now. But I know that I've got a support system and it's about to take it all the way back to the beginning, Blair Palmer. It's about having that support around you, whether that's you're an entrepreneur and you have a really, really good assistant or whether that is I'm a freelancer. So I'm going to surround, I'm going to find other freelancers to have a gang with and I'm going to connect with them online and we can hold each other accountable, whether that is connecting with a coach or somebody who gets your business and can kind of help you move your business forward. You have to find that connection and you have to put support around you. And please, 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 audience, do it before three and a half months. Because if you get to remote worker syndrome and you don't have that support built around you and you don't know that this is what's happening, it's not going to be, it's not going to be very nice. And it's going to be really uncomfortable. And you will either go back to what is known and comfortable or you'll push through. Please push through. You'll be fine. Yeah, I, I, the, the point you make is, is spot on because it, you can, fit, it's very isolating and it, it doesn't, you don't have to be working remotely to be isolated. Any kind of change is a, is a disruption and you are going to go on, if it's a significant disruption, whether it looks like it should be from the outside or not, if it's a significant disruption to you, you will end up in that belly of the whale. And it will happen at about three to four months or so um, into the journey. If, if you are on your own, if you are isolated, if you don't have a good network of friends or colleagues or a coach or any, any of those people to be your, your team, then as I call it, if you're alone, you'll go home. So you will, you will go back to what was known that you know that you can handle. You'll pack it in the business or you'll go back to the job you used to have or you'll um, give up on the writing project that you're doing because it's just got a bit hard. Whatever it is, you will, you will give up on it at that point. If you don't have people around you who firstly are cheerleaders for you and saying you can do it but secondly, can just take some of the, the pressure away. And what you did for me last week was a combination of both. It was a kind of, okay, let it all out. <laughs> let it all out. There was a bit of that, uh, which I needed to do. Um, and then there was a, okay, give me, give me this, this, and this, and I will sort that out for you. And these other couple of things you're going to have to sort out yourself because no one can do it but, but you. But that was fine. And, and um, you know, within 24 hours, the problem had pretty much, well, the, the problems had gone away. So um, that, that combination of the cheerleader support and the practical support up front, you have that in place when you need it at three and a half months and you hit the wall. Um, that you're going to really, really be grateful. But it goes back to what you said, you have to let people help you. So you have to, at that point, tell someone or tell some people, I'm in, I'm in trouble. It's really interesting because that was, I felt during, I mean, we're, we're bearing it all here now about, about that call that we had where you were in your belly of, and that was a belly of a whale moment, right? I mean, you're being real, so I'll be real in return. It, I was worried about you. I was concerned about you as your friend and as, as, your, as somebody who works with you. I, you know, part of me was thinking, oh, I need her to do a few things. Are we going to get anything done today? Or is today going to be a, we need to take it, we need to just look at tomorrow kind of thing. But knowing that you are brave and that you kind of got this. And, and you know what, Blair, you were talking about a support network. It doesn't have to even be friends. Go on Twitter and put in hashtag freelancer and see who pops up and start some conversations. Most of my freelance friends are random strangers on the internet that I am now very, very close with. And I know if I need a break, I can go on Twitter and I can send a tweet going, oh, some this is wrong or this is really right. And I'll get support from strangers. Because I've done that, and that's what works for me. But having a trusted confidant, a good assistant, making uh, your parents, your family, your partner, your friends, it's, it's really, it's not just outsourcing that you do. You absolutely need to put your outsource team together if you, if you, you know, duh, right? But it's, 
I don't know. I guess it's being a little bit proud of yourself for being brave and cutting yourself some slack and realizing that, wow, what I'm doing is really different. People might not agree with it. People might really agree with it. But having somebody in your corner and somebody that, that knows what's going on that you can pass things to, even if it's just the emotional strain of, I feel really bad about this. So having somebody with two extra shoulders or five or six extra shoulders, and five, couldn't have five extra shoulders, but having somebody to, to a problem shared is a problem halved. I'm all about the, the quotes today, I realized. But just having that support network around you that can take some of the strain, it, it'll help you go further. And you know what? I also think if you're in the belly of the whale, and you may disagree with this because you're the coach and I'm not, but if you're in the belly of the whale and it's not the right time, if, if you get to remote worker syndrome and, and you don't know what to do and it's not what you wanted, and, and it's not what you thought it was going to be. And it kind of doesn't feel like it's ever going to get any better. It's okay to also realize that whatever you're doing isn't right for you and to re regroup and, and rethink, you know, just because you decide I am going to achieve this great gamble. Well, what's really the penalty if you don't get there? Awesome. Go do, but maybe sometimes, you know, have you ever known anybody to start at point A and get to point B without having to sort of rejig things in the middle? because life happens. So I, I think uh, definitely put some support around you, but also be aware that, that and, and try to connect with other remote workers or whatever, somebody like you who might not know you, because they'll have fresh perspective on, oh, that happened to me that one time and I was able to do this or whatever, but you are perfectly capable of putting a community in place around you. With just a little bit of effort, you can find people who will support you, whether that's outsourced support or whether that's just emotional friends, strangers on the internet kind of support. Yeah, I think the, the, I agree with everything you said. The one thing that I would, um, that I'd be a little cautious about is making any bold, big decisions when you're in the belly of the whale. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no. Sorry, I, I should have so imagined. I would have, I would still be living in, in America. So hey, don't listen to me. Yes, I very. I'm sorry. Should have really caveated that. Yeah, I, I think I think absolutely to make some tweaks. I mean, there were some changes that we decided to make last week, and um, but I think the most important thing you can do in, in that belly of the whale is is absolutely to to connect with your to with your friends or your family or whoever it is that you talk to in those moments and get some help, get, get some emotional support and get some practical help. And then once you've calmed down, which is maybe 24 hours later or, you know, a few days later, or even later on that afternoon, sometimes that's, that's enough. Then you can step back a little and say, are there any tweaks that I need to make to this? Um, are there any reasons that this happened? Because it's normally triggered by something, which is one of the reasons that it's a bit misleading because you think to yourself, well, this isn't the belly of the whale. This is because... A happened, B happened, C happened, and D happened. Yeah, kind of, but those things happened. It wasn't a coincidence that they happened. The, the timing was right for that, that set of things to happen and to plunge you into the belly of the whale. So um, I wouldn't blame circumstances entirely, but, but when you have that opportunity to reflect, that's when you say to yourself, okay, it, it cannot, reverse engineering that a little bit, do we need to do anything differently? So for instance, just as an example, we were moving around too quickly. I wanted to see too much in too short a space of time. So we've just booked, we're just about to book um, our next foreign uh, bit of this trip, which will be Ireland. Um, so we'll go back to the UK for a couple of weeks and then we'll go to Ireland. We were thinking of doing Ireland and Scotland and kind of move around. And then I thought to myself, no, that's what caused this problem last week. Um, let's just stay in Ireland for three weeks in one house and just settle into it. And then, you know, we'll go to the next place after that. There's no need to rush because rushing is not good for us. I think, um, you know, just like any, any plan, taking the time to evaluate what, what's working and what feels good. I'm, I'm very glad to hear you're not going to try and do it all because quite frankly, I don't know if I can take another one of those calls, Blair Palmer. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. But you know, remember those people around you. Cut them some slack for once. No, but I think everything is a journey and you learn as you go. And, you know, you, what you might think you can accomplish if it turns out that something else works better, 
why wouldn't you do the better thing? So I'm glad you're finding what works for you with travel and, and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's wonderful, actually. I, I love seeing you adjust and, and how you're coping I, and what you're doing to slightly change. Uh, you still have the overall goal, but what you're doing to kind of zig and zag and, and roll with life, I, I greatly appreciate, actually, because um, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we all have life. And life doesn't come scripted and you, Lord knows you don't know what's coming up. And, and being able to flex a little bit and weave and dodge and still survive and be on track for your goal, that's wonderful. Well, Elizabeth, I mean, thank you firstly from me for helping me out so much, and particularly in these dark moments that I've had uh, recently, uh, which I'm now out of and I feel amazing. So that's really great. And uh, no small part due to you. So thank you. And thank you so much for your honesty today. Um, I really think, you know, hearing from people who, um, who have taken these gambles and who have a um, a, a kind of, I love this big girl pants who are willing to put their big girl pants on and embrace who they are and what, how they want to live. I just think that's so inspiring. So you would applaud me for my move then to have all of my staff members big girl pants made for Christmas, right? Because I did that one year. That, I, I'm, I'm all for it and I wish I had a pair myself. Well, Christmas is coming, Blair Palmer, and I know a printer and a graphic designer, so your dreams might just come true. <laughs> you know, put on your big girl pants or big boy pants if you want to be, whatever, but, you know, sometimes you just, you just need to kind of take a deep breath and get stuff done, and um, my emotional support and all of my support for you, let's have a little mutual moment, um, I'm, I'm grateful as well. I've learned so much from you. And I know I speak for all of the audience when I say that, but being real and knowing that the people we admire and the people that we're following have real problems and, and, and real lives. And it's refreshing, actually. You know me and my Instagram smug stuff. I love that you've been honest that you weren't in a great place and that you reached out to people who could help you feel better or you were in the belly of the whale. Nobody talks about the belly of the whale. Nobody talks about remote worker syndrome. Why don't we talk about it? So I think it's really brave and I think it's awesome. You go Blair Palmer, you got this. Thanks Elizabeth, it's been wonderful talking to you. It's been lovely Blair Palmer, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was great talking to Elizabeth. Everyone needs an Elizabeth and a Karen and a Ben and the bunch of brilliant friends and family who surround me. And you've got your own. I know you do. Not everyone in your life is going to get it or know how to help you. But if you try to do anything completely alone, you will go home. So find your network, find your gang before you need them, before the belly of the whale moment. And, uh, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference to the success of your brilliant gamble. By the way, the other half of Two Desks, Elizabeth's partner, Ped, wrote and performed our brilliant theme tune. He's part of Fuselage, and you can find their music at fanlink.2, that's T-O, slash Fuselage. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. And if you want to get in touch with Elizabeth or follow her on social media, she is at geek underscore assistant. And I will put that in the show notes too. Plus, of course, please stay in touch with us if you're feeling a bit wobbly or you've got full on belly of the whale syndrome, then please let us know. You can do that on social media or you can even PM me if it's a little bit more private. And here with the beautiful music written by Ped and the lovely Ivy Bell Palmer is how you can do that. To hear from you, you can get all the episodes of this show plus read the blog and find out more about our travel adventure at www.brilliantgamble.com. Sign up to the newsletter and get an advance notice of classes and programs Mummy is running. Plus, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Brilliant Gamble. Finally, please leave a review and star rating for this podcast on iTunes as it helps people find us and take a brilliant gamble of their own.